Right, welcome to this session. I'm going to talk about migrating workloads from the Envoy Cloud Stack. My name is Alessandro Bialti. I'm the CEO of a company called Cloud Based Solutions, where we do a lot of things like related to OpenStack, Kubernetes, Stack, and uh, um, Let's talk a little bit about the context. Well, to begin with, um, there is always a constant change, you know, between technological generations, right? So we went from physical servers to VM. From traditional VMs, we moved to infrastructure as a service, then we went to containers. Uh, now we're still going to serverless, right? So there is a constant transition, right? Um, usually applications tend to survive more than one of the generations, right? So you, you might want to decide what to do in the process with all the stuff. You might uh, want to rewrite a line of business next generation applications by retaining the investments of what you have. You might want to rewrite part of it. You know, there is a lot of potentially possibilities around that. Um, but most important, you might also to improve retain your TCO. On, on the subject, um, uh, recently, uh, .com slash VMware made us, of course, a big present <laughs> in, uh, in changing the pricing significantly in their product line, which of course translated in a significant uptick in, uh, in the request for migrations that didn't exist before in the volumes that we're seeing right now, right? Um, last but not least, there is a lot of return from public clouds to on-prem. You know, when we started doing OpenStack more than 10 years ago, we were really puzzled about how easily companies decided to move to hyperscalers in a scenario in which cost-wise they make absolutely any sense. So of course we can talk about CapEx or OpEx and the other, the other, but very often this didn't make sense from a strictly uh, monetary point of view. And what you're seeing today is a lot of companies actually moving back exactly for this reason. Then of course there are new scenarios. For example, edge computing is something that didn't necessarily exist a few years ago. Um, you might have a um, new on-prem cloud infrastructure. You might have new on-prem hardware. You might want to move from on-prem to public clouds. You might want to move from public to on-prem. You might want to redeploy on-prem. So there are a lot of reasons why you might want to migrate workloads, right? So there is not just one single use case, which is the one, of course, which is the main topic we are talking today, which is the uh, VM work to open stack transition, right? But we see very often companies wanting to move, and institutions wanting to move their workloads from one generic point A to one generic point B, right? And what we want to avoid is vendor lock-in in this process. We want to make sure that people, companies, are, are free to move their workloads, right, without necessarily having to be stuck in a specific environment. Um, we are going to talk about one specific um, option, which is so-called uh, re-hosting, aka lift and shift, but that's not the only way to move one workload from one way to the other. For example, an extremely popular option these days is re-platforming which consists uh, in uh, taking your workloads for, for example, VMs or physical servers and whatnot, uh, and containerize them so that you can run in Docker or Kubernetes. Right? Um, we are talking about lift and shift uh, primarily because it's a much easier thing to do, because it doesn't require to have almost any context about what runs inside of a VM. So one of the big props of uh, re-hosting or lift and shift is the fact that uh, we can treat the VMs, the servers, and the black boxes. We don't have to care too much about what's inside. Okay? Um, up to a point, of course, right? But uh, we don't need to completely uh, take and uh, look at every single service which is there. That's all that you would do for a time. On the contrary, um, on the con side, uh, you're, especially if you're moving from an environment, a an old school environment like VMware, to a modern one like a cloud, on prem or hyperscalers or whatnot. Um, you're not really taking advantage, of course, of a cloud native paradigm, right? You still have a VM and whatever was running inside of that VM, right? You're not uh, magically rewriting your application so that it can actually work in the context of, of a cloud. Yeah. But uh, very often we see that companies are happy with that. We typically, it's part of a whole complex journey which consists in taking those workloads and adding new ones which are typically cloud native, you know? Because if you listen to the typical uh, evangelists, especially from big hyperscalers and everything, their idea is like always like rewrite, rewrite, rewrite. But you're not going to rewrite a huge application to take years to write, right? In, in, in one day. 
So it's always like a process. Replatforming is much more than taking the bytes from one side and putting them in on the other side. There are a bunch of steps, quite a few of them actually. You have to deal with different type of disk formats. You have to deal with different type of synthetic kernel drivers. For example, VMware.io, when you talk about KVM, VMware Tools, when we talk about of course, VMware, LIS, Linux Integration Service, when we talk about Hyper-V, and so on, right? So when you move from one hypervisor to another, you have, of course, to make sure that your VM is talking in the most efficient way to the underlying host, right? You cannot just take, uh, take a VM move from one place to another and make it work. Similarly, especially when, uh, for the case of Windows, you might have drivers that are simply blue screen if you move them to different hardware. So you have to take care of those things as well. Um, initrd if you have Linux, you might very often want to rebuild your initrd images to include the new drivers and remove the old ones. SC Linux, if you swap hardware underneath uh, a machine, which is a uh, using SC Linux, of course, you're going to have a lot of troubles because SC Linux is designed exactly to recognize this type of efforts as happening or other bad scenarios. You might have different PCI IDs, right? You have um, hardware devices, including networks, that uh, get different IDs at the moment in which you move them from one hardware to another, virtual or physical, doesn't matter in this context. Different network configurations, and so on. And you can also have different provisioning agents. For example, once you move from VMware to uh, an open stack or a general like cloud, you might have cloud in it on Linux or cloud based in it on Windows for, uh, for getting metadata specific to the cloud environments where you are currently living. Um, okay. In uh, quite a few years ago, that was around 2016, we implemented actually um, um, a service which was actually meant to do this type of work. So. We were doing migrations way before they were cool, <laughs> to say so right. Um, the reasons why we did it is because at the time we were deploying all of our shiny new open stacks. And customers, of course, were stuck with a lot of VMs on the VMware side. So we wanted to help them, right, reducing completely um, as much as possible all the friction in moving these VMs from the old VMware to the new open stack. Um, what started as a simple service that we had as an add-on, right, as a, as a key differentiator, if you want, for our own OpenStack deployments first, and then even, even Kubernetes with QGROUP later on, um, became a, a, an, um, a product line by itself. It became something that became a business line by itself. And nowadays, of course, it's blooming thanks to, thanks to the, 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 the nice changes that we mentioned before in the welcome VMware use case. We wrote Coriolis exactly like you would write uh, an OpenStack service. We come from a background uh, as uh, um, OpenStack contributors, right? If you look at pretty much everything Windows related in, in OpenStack is, comes from cloud-based solutions. So when we wrote this service, this Coriolis service, um, it was exactly meant to be in function like an OpenStack service. It had to be fully scalable, um, have a nice REST API on top, or using Keystore for identity management, and whatever other services we could obtain. That means that Coriolis can be integrated in an OpenStack cloud just as an migration service, or like most people do, simply put inside an appliance or multiple appliances and sit on top of your cloud and perform the migration for you. It was also meant to scale, so be fully automated and scale. Doesn't matter if you want to do one VM migrated or thousands of them, it has to work, right? In terms of architecture, um, you can see here on the screen right now, um, if you're familiar with OpenStack components, this should be relatively familiar as well. So you have a REST API endpoint, Keystone for all the identity, management, right? um, a client on top, which is both a, a GUI and a CLI, uh, a conductor, which communicates, of course, uh, via MQB, so via queues with, uh, with the REST API and other components. Uh, okay, a database, of course, for storing uh, um, uh, configurations. MQP, again, for communicating with a scheduler, which takes care of scheduling, of course, our jobs for migrations and replicas. And then a bunch of worker processes, which are in charge of communicating with the individual clouds. Okay? Coriolis is completely decoupled from the individual uh, specific clouds of virtualization environments in the sense that uh, it's not hard-coded and hardwired to work on EPM or OpenStack, for example, but it can do any cloud to any cloud or virtualization environment, right? 
It does that to a, let's call it a plugin architecture in which each one of those um, um, uh, providers, as we call them, which are specific for that specific logic to, that is necessary to talk to a specific cloud of equalization environment, are completely encapsulated and decoupled from the rest of the reality. Right? So if a customer comes and says, I want to have support for another environment, we don't have to touch Coriolis in any way. We just have to implement another one of these um, providers, which lives outside of Coriolis itself. Uh, providers are divided into source and target ones. Okay? Um, so source is from where you're migrating for, target is where you're migrating to. Barbican is also used for storing secrets. Okay? By secrets, in this case, we mean, of course, the uh, necessary um, credentials which you need to connect uh, to the given cloud or, or the environment. Here is a quick list of the supported environments that we have. OpenStack is one of them with all the possible hypervisors. KVM, of course, is what everybody uses these days, but also Hyper-V, um, SXI, well, okay, and so on. Azure, AWS, Oracle CI, and Oracle CI Classic. Next week, I'm actually in Las Vegas to present at OCW a similar demo specific to, 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 the, to the Oracle virtualization technologies. Um, VMware, vSphere, or plain simple SXI, Hyper-V and System Center, uh, Sense Server, Basic or Virtual KVM, Oracle VM, um, or basically, Kubernetes with Cloud Kubert, right? Because very often customers want to mix VMs and containers, so Kubert, why not? And also bare metal, right? So if you have machines of bare metal, we have a special agent which allows you to do that. Um, Coriolis is completely um, um, agentless. So one of the key um, aspects we had in mind when we designed Coriolis was to make sure that we didn't need to inject anything inside of the source VMs. Our customers typically have to migrate thousands and thousands of VMs. Either by policy or by practicality, it's impossible typically to install an agent inside of those VMs. Right? Um, in this way, we don't have to do anything. We need only to connect to the underlying environment, meaning the cloud APIs or VMware APIs and whatnot, and that will handle it. Okay? Of course, in, we need to know what's inside of the VMs, not in terms of services, but in terms of uh, configuration drivers and everything, as we talked before. That is performed in, an, in a step that happens on the target environment in which we mount temporarily the disks coming from the migrating VM into a temporary VM, we inspect the content, and we perform the necessary actions. Rebuilding in interviews, injecting drivers, stuff like that. Okay? So we don't touch any of the data on the user side. We only look at the configurations from the, uh, for the operating system, both on Linux and on Windows. Um, there is a, inside of this temporary VM, we have a working process that will detect the type of operating system and distro, in the case of Linux, right? And based on that, it will decide what to do. Because, of course, uh, the things you have to do on, on Debian and Ubuntu are different than what you have to do, for example, on the head head or on Linux and so on. We have a, quite a big list of uh, supported guest operating system. So pretty much all the possible RHEL, CentOS, Oracle, Linux, Rocky, and so on. Debian 7 Plus, Ubuntu 12 or 4 Plus, um, SUSE, SLE Plus, Fedora, OpenSUSE, Windows, so all the supported Windows versions, basically, both client and servers, and so on. And adding, again, also the, the individual operating system, guest operating systems are decoupled from the core of Coriolis, meaning that if a customer wants to um, add support for any new distribution, they can do it. Um, um, we can do it by, by adding support to that without having to touch it or be honest, right? Short question, uh, have you ever considered uh, open OIDA? Open OIDA, we didn't, but we can, <laughs> why not? Okay. Uh, okay, Coriolis has a common line interface and, and, and a GUI. Um, again, also the common line interface is written like your typical OpenStack common line, right? So it, Using it, it's very familiar if you come from an OpenStack background. But even if you don't, it's very simple because it's just uh, sitting on top of the underlying REST API. And most important, we have also a GUI, which is very useful, especially for, for uh, situations in which a customer might not want to deal specifically with the command line. So that's particularly useful in an enterprise use case. 
It's a single page application, and it's standalone, works directly to the background uh, um, uh, REST APIs. It's very, it's very, it's very active. We'll see it in action. Now, Coronis started as a, as a migration tool, but afterwards, we added support also for disaster recovery as a service. This was a, a feature that was constantly asked, so at some point we added it as well. Um, you might see from a business standpoint migrations and disaster recovery as two completely independent use cases, but in reality they share a lot of their common technology underneath. Um, migration itself is actually uh, implemented, as we will see soon, uh, as a, with the same type of disaster recovery technology. Why? Because uh, we want to anyway minimize downtime. So when we do a migration, we want the user to be able to use the source VM as long as possible and just flick the switch at the end and be able to start the target environment without losing the internet process. Okay. Now, um, okay, if the source cloud allows it, data is backed up incrementally to the target while the source VM is still running. So for example, in the case of VMware, we do that of course with uh, snapshots and the okay, these snapshots. Migration is performed as the last step directly on the target cloud. So basically what we do is that we incrementally copy over all the data that changes of the source with the snapshots, right? And only at the end, when the user wants, we press the button and we start the target environment. No need for the source VM to be available, especially in this particularly useful in case of disaster, right? Um, as long as the data is on the target side, we have all the data, plus we have all the needed configuration. We don't need actually access to the source. When we talk about disaster recovery, there are two terms that always come to mind, RPO and RTO. So the RPO, the recovery point objective, is actually the last time you executed a replica, which is one of those incremental operations that I'm going to demo very soon. The RTO on the other side is the, uh, based on the migration from replica, which is the moment in which from the replicated disk that you have on the target, you press the button and you say, okay, start this VM. Okay? which depends largely on your target environments. We go from a few seconds to a few minutes, because it depends on how fast your target cloud is. So the whole process, going back now to, to the migration itself, it's divided into primary steps. One that we call replica, as already introduced, which consists of replicating the data from the source to the target in an incremental fashion. And then the migration itself, which consists in starting from that migrated data, uh, replicated data, and starting basically VM. Okay. Um, this is useful also and can be also integrated, for example, in CI pipelines, because very often you want to test also your workloads to make sure they work right in your target. So one thing that is very useful for typical users is that uh, you can leave your VMs running on the source, and we perform all this replication underneath. The users don't even notice it now. Uh, and then on the target, we can take a snapshot of those disks automatically, start a VM, right? Then the user can run whatever test they want against the VM. Let's say that the application consists in, a, in a, for example, a web front end, some middleware, and some databases, right? So if you migrate all those VMs at once, right? And then you might want to check that everything works. Then once you check it, if you want, you can delete all those VMs without affecting the replicated disk because you perform all this work automatically from a snapshot, right? And then eventually, when you want, you, you put the trigger, you shut down the source, so we always can do that for you. Source VM will come down, last migration for the last bits that might have changed in the meantime, and then start on the target, okay? All right, we're getting close to, to the demo. Um, I will start it right now, just to have enough time, right? And then I will talk about a couple of uh, more advanced spots. What you're seeing here right now is the UI of Coriolis, the one I mentioned before. So here I can have my replicas, migrations, cloud endpoints, and then a few additional topics that we might touch later. Um, the first important thing are these endpoints here. For the sake of speed, migrating a VM is something that takes time, right? So I'm going very fast to the basic concept. Uh, we already have a bunch of endpoints created, most important, two of them that we need now, one from vSphere and one from OpenStack. VMware, OpenStack, right? Now, um, if you want to create a new endpoint, you just go here, new endpoint, you select the type, let's say for example VMware, and here you fill it up with all the data specific 
needed to connect to that cloud. Right. Here are all the possible lists of the available ones. If you want to open stack, also here you have a list of options. And you can also go to advanced to be more granular in the type of things you need. For example, if you have self signed certificates, you might want to turn on this allow and trust, right? Um, getting a bit back to the simple one, you can select what type of uh, keystone endpoint you have, and based on that, it will ask you if you need project details or a tenant and so on. I'm not going to go into these details because, of course, we don't have time, right? I already created a replica, which is this one. I will show you in a moment how to create a new one, but first I want to start executing this one. So this one, this replica was already executed once, actually more than once, and uh, we copied over basically all the disk contents from the source to the target. Why did we do it before? To save time, right? What I'm going to show you right now is that I'm going to change something on the source environment, then I'm going to press the button to execute the replica, this data will come to the target. I will create a migration. You will see the changed files on the target. Okay? So this is my source environment. I'm going to migrate an, an Ubuntu 22.04. Here it is, right? By the way, I'm connected via VPN to Romania, where our headquarters are, right? So hopefully the demo gods, at least in terms of VPNs and networking, will be kind to us today. So let's say that we, we write a, a, a message inside here, okay? So we have a file, I lose that one. So I have a new file that didn't exist before. And um, I am going to go back here to my replica, click on execute. Started, okay? Now we can see what's happening here. The first thing happening is that we are validating the source input. So we, before starting anything, it's controlling that all the possible configuration is correct. You don't want to be half an hour into a replica and find out that you have some misconfiguration at the beginning, right? So it checks all the possible connections and everything. The next thing that happens is going to get all the instance information. Because between the replica executions, you might also have changed, for example, the size of the VM. For example, it might have been four gigabytes of RAM before, and now it's eight. No? You want to change this information. So it fetches all this data and saves it all. Validates the replica destination, deploys replica disks if needed, which was very fast because we already had the disks. And uh, the next thing that happens, it starts a temporary VM, and that VM will start uh, uh, copying over data. No? So what you're seeing here, it's all the process, all the various um, settings. Of course, I don't know if you can see it with the resolution here. Yeah, it's really good. Um, it shows you all the individual steps, no? So now it's waiting for connectivity. It started basically a temporary VM, and now it's connecting that VM to, to that source. Attaching volumes. And finally, getting ready to replicate. So this is a temporary VM to which we create basically an HTTPS endpoint. And over that, we're streaming basically data in a very efficient way, and of course, a very secure way encrypted. Good, that finished. So you can see all these various steps. It's creating a snapshot on the source side, now talking to VMware. Snapshot done. Now you see that this, there are two disks attached to this VM. Since we already performed a replica before, we already had 97% of the disk replicated, so it was extremely fast. It's already done, and now it's taking down those temporary VMs that we created, okay? That's it. So this is the replica process. Basically, with this, we replicated the content of the source disk from VMware into OpenStack. What we want to do now, Create migration, so this is basically creating a migration from a replica. There are a bunch of options here. I'm not going to go into details, but uh, the most important one is that if you're going to clone the disks or not, if you want to skip some of the processes, 
we leave it like this for the moment, okay? Click on migrating, and this creates a separate set of migration tasks. So this is the sequence of the tasks we're going through. All the tasks, wherever they can be parallelized, are parallelized, okay? When they have to be in sequence, they are, of course, waiting one for the, for the results of the other. You can migrate thousands of VMs in parallel, right? It's, it all depends on, the, uh, on your environment, right? So people usually ask, how many VMs can I migrate in parallel? Well, it depends on your network bottlenecks, in your IOPS bottlenecks, all that's it, right? But replicas can be scheduled, so you can decide when to run them and stuff like that. So now, again, a few checks at the beginning, deploying resources, and now it's starting what we call internally the OS morphing VM. So which is that VM which will inspect the content of the machine and perform whatever actions. In this case, it will remove the VMware tools, install the cloud, cloud in it, and whatnot. Um, minions, we will talk about it also shortly later. Now we are creating them from scratch, but you can also have minion pools configured in Coriolis. So those minions are already pre-created and get assigned to your migration tasks when needed. And then when the migration tasks are free, they return to the pool. This is particularly useful on, uh, on um, hyperscale, so creating VMs is always a very slow process, right? So it's much easier to assign it. Quickly. So we started attaching volumes. So we have uh, two disks in this VM, so we are attaching both of them to the machine. And then, now it's connecting to it. This step usually takes a little bit longer because we have to wait for the machine to come up, be available for IP, and then basically there is a process which connects with SSH, right? I can show you also in the meantime here, if I look at my instances. This is the, the target OpenStack environment, right? So, and here there is a temporary VM which is running. You can see Coriolis test the name of the VMs and then a bunch of data that helps identify it, right? It's currently running. Okay. Here it goes. Removing packages, open VM tools. Okay. All this thing is dynamic. Again, it detects from where it comes from and where it's going, right? Then it, it detected it comes from VM where it's going to OpenStack, okay VM, removing open VM tools. It does in the process also, of course, an update. Um, Bing, Bing Ubuntu does an up, maybe the update, right? And then it's installing Cloud Init. So this is the, one of the most important steps, right? Moving the bits from the source to the target that starts the VM, that's the easy part. But this is where a lot of the logic stands, right? This is a lot of extremely helpful in, in the process. There. That's pretty much it. So everything is finished. Now it's time to start the VM out of those disks, which is starting now. Creating migrated instance in the process. Uh, by the way, one thing I should tell you, Coriolis can also save and reapply the same, uh, uh, for example, MAC addresses, right? You can take all this information for the source and replicate it as a target. You can decide if you want fixed or DHCP network. You can recreate basically your whole networking configuration of the target. For the VMs, it's completely transparent. That's it. Now let's go quickly on the target. Refresh the instance. And here it's our shiny VM. The name is the same one from the source, but you can also change name if you want. Uh, It's low with the VPN, now on the console. Okay. You see, Cloud Init is running since we just started the VM.
Okay. And if we look, there is a file called demo.txt. Voila, you see, I also, so the same file here also. Right? So this basically ends the demo. I could demo many more things. There are so many features in Coriolis, but the time is what it is. Um, okay, so we are right exactly on the on the spot with the 30 minutes right now. So 